Hot breath. Do I get big fancy yeah. headphones? We don't have headphones. We oh. could do headphones. Are you gonna wear headphones? These got some fancy microphones. I told myself when I start monetizing this thing, then I'll be able to up my game to headphones. <laughs> That's when I know I made it, when headphones are in play. <laughs> do most interviews you do have headphones? No. <clears throat> I just thought I saw it on pictures. People were like drinking headphones. I know Tone was drinking mimosas. I saw that. Yeah, that was him. He's so good. That was his. He's a fucking idiot. <laughs> She's so nuts. <laughs> He's great, though. He's fucking crazy. I love him to death. Yeah. His parents live down the street from me. Oh, really? Yeah. And we didn't know that. Why would we know that? But like, he came in town one time and I didn't have a car. He's like, oh, I want to come hang out. I didn't have a car or a job because, you know, I'm a lady. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's like, come hang out with me. I'll come pick you up. And I was like, all right. And I give him my address. He's like, why the hell are you a mile and a half away? And I was like, <laughs> uh, I guess I live near your parents' house. So yeah, like a mile and a half from his parents. If I'm, yeah, like a mile and a half. And you both? One stand up NBC. NBC looks stand -up. like it. He did like if you listen to his interview on Hot Breath Podcast. Oh, uh, I listen to it. Well, he he did like he did like Uptown and like bombed. He did something with a Blacktop Improv. Oh, I remember them. And he said he said he got booed there. And um, yeah, it was the first time I went up uh, Uptown because Big Kenny tried to call me and doing Blacktop, <laughs> and I did bomb, but I didn't do great. And I'd probably only doing stand up like less than a year. Oh, wow. And Big Kenny tried to get me to do it. And the other guys in Blacktop were like, no, nah, you're good. And Pat Brown was there. And uh, I did all right. And there's like one other time I got up in Uptown. And I had a perfectly fine set. Mm -hmm. And that fucking asshole DJ, Ant or Maggie, <laughs> Aunt or whatever love, the yeah. fuck his name is, <laughs> like, started playing the music they play for when people bomb. And the yeah. host got up and was, and everyone was like, what are you doing? Yeah, and even yeah. the host was like, she didn't, why are you playing <laughs> this music for her? And he goes, I mean, I know she didn't bomb, but I ain't like it that much. And he's like, that's not the fucking point. And so my mother's in the bottom just going like this. And I sit down and she's like, I'm putting a hit out on that little bit. <laughs> Cause we, I've been, like, I've been uptown a bunch of times. I've never seen him. Yeah. Yeah. Because you can't see him. He's an aunt. Right. Yeah. So the DJ booth is bigger than he is. Definitely. He doesn't even know who's on fucking stage. <laughs> and then the girl, there was this girl who went up before me, and all she talked about was how she just graduated from college, and everyone was like applauding and shit. She didn't tell, I don't even think she told a single fucking joke. <laughs> but she yeah. started by saying that she just graduated from college, so nobody wanted to boo her stand up. Yeah. And I'm in the back like, boo this bitch. I graduated <laughs> from college too. <laughs> this is not a fucking accomplishment. <laughs> So she can do homework? Boo! <laughs> Fucking bullshit. Whatever. Are we recording yet? We're, we are recording. Please, I should say, um, dice tu nombre, por favor. <laughs> I am Dulce Sloan. I do the stand-ups and acting and improv and sketch and stuff. Uh, Dulce Sloan. Dulce. Uh, bienvenidos a Hot Breath. <laughs> The best part about speaking Spanish is that I, uh, I had an Uber driver named Julio in LA the other night. And this little motherfucker gets in and he was like, oh, can you do this with the heat? Can you roll on the windows? Can you like turn on the air conditioning? How are you guys? And I'm like, shut the fuck up. It's <laughs> two in the morning. Be quiet. And this fucker has a list of demands. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, I really like this song. Can you turn it up? And then I just start talking to the Uber driver in Spanish. So, of course, he turned the radio down. Oh, yeah. So he could talk to me. In the course of the conversation, I'm like, your boy's probably upset that you turned the radio <laughs> down. And we're cracking the fuck up. Yeah, oh yeah. Because he has absolutely no idea what's going on. So. It's a nice little weapon. Like It is. I'm not fluent, but I know enough to get like discounts. Yeah, like I know enough like. to get like a drink in an uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so you married, you got a boyfriend. I just wanted more fries. Yeah. Like, I don't <sighs> Te gustas Corona? No, I don't know no, fucking no, no. Corona, dude. No, I was like, oh, you got a marry, you got a boyfriend, you got kids. 
more fries. I'm not going <laughs> through this with you, sir. Get the fuck out Mas of here. Mas papas fritas. Por favor. <laughs> Yeah, I got four husbands. I got 72 kids and I have no interest in this conversation. <laughs> Fuck out of my face. Mm. Well, thank you so much. I should yeah. be saying thank you for doing this. Um, thank you for asking me. Uh, I'm, it's, With all these it's cool people honor. on here. I was like, oh man, I hope he asked me. And then he did. Teased me. How'd you get hot water yes. this fast? Was I was like, prepared. Ah! Yeah, I had. I you, When you said you were in McDonough, I was like, okay, let me Google Maps <laughs> how far away McDonough is. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm, I'm 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 late. <laughs> no, you're you are not late compared to some people who are like, yeah, yeah, today. And then when I do some phone interviews, one time somebody gave me the wrong phone number. What? Yeah. Um. Another time they just didn't answer, and then like sent me a Facebook message. Oh, sorry about that. And then I had to do it like the next week or something, you know. And so like know. thirty minutes isn't bad compared to days or a week oh, and a half. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm like. I got oh I can stop to get food. Ah, Joel. <laughs> I don't want to be an awful person. So no, you're you're great. I've, in doing this, I've learned you know scheduling is a very uh, flexible word. Yes. So I appreciate you just doing it in the same day that and I you, said I was going to do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> and you not going all Hollywood yet because you just won NBC stand up. So it's or yeah. stand up for NBC, I guess it's, it's, it's formerly uh, NBC stand up for diversity. Yeah, it's it's a stand up NBC now. Mm -hmm. Apparently, they took off the diversity. <laughs> I don't know what white kids do, but because there's like in like the showcase, there's eight people, and uh, the only like legit white dude also had like a glass eye. <laughs> so <laughs> there are no fully function like when there were no able like fully un just full white dudes mm -hmm. there which is nothing just i'm just a white man that, that guy wasn't there well ian aber he's from atlanta technically he's the gay but i guess he would be the considered the gay guy yeah he's gay and he's half latino but it's good to see atlanta out there representing and of course we've had others like lavar walker and tone bell of course you know connected to the nbc stand-up brand i gotta ask you off and the rob did it rob hayes too <laughs> I can't believe I forgot Rob Hayes. Of course, all have been on Hot Breath as well. Oh, because I know I had to mention Rob Hayes. I got a fucking phone call. <laughs> Why'd you say me? I didn't want to say you. Me and Rob are friends. That's fine. Shout out to Rob Hayes. He was actually the first uh, Hot Breath episode. He was the inaugural episode of Hot Breath. So That makes perfect sense. Shouts out to him. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask you right off the bat with NBC Stand Up and you winning... Did you rock the bra out? Yeah, of course. You rocked it out on the final. Of course. <laughs> and no one knew. Um, because I'd like every time I when I wear that to a show, I, um, if it's not like if it's here, everybody knows. But like when like when I did Montreal and when I did this, I uh I wear a camel, like I wear a shrug. Mm -hmm. So I'm completely wrapped up. And even with and with it being winter, I have like a wrap over it. So no one knows what I'm wearing <laughs> until I get right before, right when they're announcing my, like when they're introducing me, mm -hmm. that's when I take everything off and then I go upstage. So no one knew what I had on. Oh my God. Except for Christina, who was like also in the, like, who was also showcasing Christina Galston. Like I, I was like, girl, watch this. I was like, girl, come here. And she was like, ah, <laughs> I see you. So yeah, no one, no one knew what the fuck I was wearing. <laughs> And I guess you got to link up with Tone Bell while you were there. Was that your first time meeting him or you guys knew each other before? No, I met him back in like, I think it was 2011 or 2012. He um he came and did relapse. Right. Um, and I was like, he's amazing and I love him. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, he came and did relapse, and then we've just kind of been cool since then, just because like his parents live so close to me. Yeah. Every time he comes back in town, he's at his parents' house. So, and like he was, um, he hosted the sh the final showcase in LA. So he, um, like I was able to talk to him like beforehand. And I'm like, I was like, I'm nervous. He's like, shut up. So <laughs> he's like, it doesn't fucking, he's just calm down, do your shit. He's like, being here is already a big deal. Yeah. Fucking roll with it. So that's and what I did. Since he won, you know, he's been on multiple mm -hmm. NBC shows. I mean, how has your life changed in just, because you won, like, within the month, I guess? Yeah, because what happened, like, they're, they usually, when we, they told us, because the thing is, we have a rehearsal on Monday, mm -hmm. and then the showcase is on Tuesday. 
But like uh, Jandis from NBC, who's awesome. Um, we sit down with her and um, some other people from the network who are in the talent infusion program. And they're like, okay, we want to see your set. And they give you notes on your set. Oh. So they give you, so they do the rehearsal so you can have notes on your set. And so your set is locked in so they know what you're going to say, basically. And, you know, you time it because we only had like six, seven minutes. Okay. So, um, yeah, they, and they, they you rehearse it first and then the show is the next night. So we did the rehearsal and there's no one else at the rehearsal other than the people who are showcasing and then four people from NBC. And we were at the um, Hollywood Improv on Melrose. So we were in this 200 seat room on that, mm-hmm. it was like two o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and they're like, all right, everybody do your set. And we're like, what the fuck, what? <laughs> and Janet's like, be supportive, don't be a dick. Yeah. And so you just sit there and you listen to everybody's set. But yeah, it's, um, yeah, Tone hosted. and uh, You won. I won. <laughs> But they told us that Monday that the results don't come out till January. Oh. So you're not supposed to find out who wins until January. And I got a phone call the next day. And then they were like, we need something for the press release. We're putting it out next week. So it usually comes out in January. But they were so jazzed about Dulce Sloan? Well, they were like, because like I was, it's I was at a uh, the City Walk Universal getting food, and uh, my uh, my manager called me, and he was like, "What you doing?" I'm like, "Getting food." He's like, "You might want to sit down," <laughs> but I didn't expect him to be telling me that mm-hmm. because it doesn't come out till January, and right. I had been auditioning for different things. Like I did like two auditions, like I'd done two auditions while I was there, or an audition already while I was there, and I was like, "Oh, maybe it's something I did tape for," and he was like. You won. And I was like, I won what? <laughs> He's like, NBC. And I was like, uh, fuck are you talking about? Um, so he was like, yeah, you won. I was like, that's one until January. He's like, well, they figured out who the winner was. So you need to give a statement for the press release. Oh. So I uh, did that. And uh, it's a 12-month talent deal. And, you know, it's auditioning with them and, you know, working with them and just seeing everything that I can do, you know, just be like, hey, Tone, what's this mean? So, you know, maybe he can explain all of it to me. Because people are like, you won. What what the fuck? What is what does this mean? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think I know all of it. <clears throat> Not quite sure I fully understand. Let me look at my contract, figure it all out. So uh, they did a press release the following Thursday. And I was coming back from Nashville. And I was... Uh, because for you, both of you that don't know, Ash, no, Nashville is four hours from Atlanta. So I had just gotten into Georgia. I was probably like 15 miles into the state. And my tire blew. Mm. Tire split down the side. <laughs> tire blew. And now I'm on the side of the road. I'm hungry. I have to pee. And it's a special time in a young girl's life. So I was very upset. Wow. And I'm sitting on the side of the road freaking out like, fuck, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I have to pee. And <laughs> I start, and the first text I got was from Big Kenny. And he was like, oh, congratulations. And I was like, huh? He's like, congratulations. I saw it on Twitter. And so I went on Twitter because Deadline is the one that put it out. And uh, I go on Twitter and I look at the timestamp. When the press release hit is when my tire blew. Two minutes of each other. Oh, my gosh. So it's like, your life is changing. Your life is exactly the same. <laughs> so my, I called my, my, and then like, and then Reg called me. And he was like, it's out. It's out. Press release is out. It's out. And I was like, yeah, that's great. I said, guess what? I, he's like, where are you at? I was like, sitting on the side of the road with a flat tire. And oh. then he just proceeds to start laughing. <laughs> and everyone, everybody was like, like, Andrew Markle called me. Um, and he was like, girl, what are you doing? Congratulations. I'm like, sitting on the side of the road with a flat tire. <laughs> ah, ha, ha. So I was like, fuck this. So I pee on the side of the road, <laughs> change my clothes so I can change his fucking tire, get all the lug nuts loosened, and then some white dad stopped. And I know he's a white dad because he was white in his summons of the car. And uh, he was like, go stand over there. And I was like, okay. And he changed my tire, lickety split. And uh, then I went to Walmart. 
because you know you're in a country ass place when there's an auto center at your local Walmart. And you're like, so what happened? I said, my tire blew. Da, 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 da. So I'm joking around with them. I said, yeah, you know what else happened today? And then I showed them the press release and they were like, this, that's funny. I was like, why the <laughs> fuck does everybody think this is hilarious? Because it is hilarious. Oh my God. That's such a beautiful irony because you've, you've built so much momentum up to that point. Not only did you win NBC, but Throughout the year, you came in second in Laughing Skull Festival, mm-hmm. and, and you got new faces at Just for Laughs. Yeah. So it's only fair near the end of the year for this to just Well, this blow. is a special time of year where cars act stupid. But the fucked up part was I bought that tire like three weeks before that. I just oh, got wow. that fucking tire. And I was like, you mother. Because the other one was messed up. And I was like, maybe I just got to stop buying used tires. Because well, everyone was like, stop buying retreads. I'm like, listen, I don't fuck retread beams, okay? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. The tire was perfectly fine when I drove. So, yeah, that was my, and I called my mom. And she's like, girl, that means you blowing up. I'm like, that's what you think this means? That's what? (laughs) My car's last for raw. Well, let's hope you, you're going to be on the road a lot. Don't you get some college tour deal with this as well? Um, There is a college tour that you get, but I was already doing I was already doing college shows. With NACA? Right, with NACA. Uh-huh. So I applied to five NACAs and I got into three of them. And so I went to beautiful exotic places like Tulsa, Oklahoma, <laughs> Buffalo, New York, and uh-huh. Grand Lansing, Michigan, which to get to Grand Lansing, you have to take a sip, separate fucking plane uh. from Chicago <laughs> to, to Grand Lansing. Is it your Grand Lansing? You're fucking... <laughs> Grand Rapids, and all the plane ride consists of is flying over one of the Great Lakes. It's a total fucking plane ride. I'm like, how big is this fucking lake for this plane ride to take an hour? But then you realize you're in a plane that only had, like, there was probably, like, 20 rows of seats, but one row, but one aisle down the side, there was only one seat per row. Oh, yeah. It's one of those, I didn't know commuter planes were a thing, because I don't live that way, but... <laughs> Tiny fucking plane. Um, so, yeah, and I booked, like, all these college shows. And then I got to go out to L.A. for pilot season. So it's going to be a lot of back and forth. Because all the shows I booked are on the East Coast. Mm-hmm. So it's going to be a lot of bouncing back and forth. Well, this is this is mm-hmm. what you've been working for, though. Yeah, because, like, I got to quit my day job, uh, which is how I'm here right now. Um, I got to quit my day job, like, a month ago. Was that after Just for Laughs you quit or? I, uh, uh-uh. I uh-huh. quit because, um, like, the thing is, I was only supposed to get, <laughs> most supposed to get five days off a year. Okay. And my boss let me take 13 <laughs> because of festivals and, you know, having to go to LA in September. Yeah. And she was like, uh, she was like, well, the deal is I got to get her a Mercedes is the fucking deal. Wow. Um. But she was really supportive of me. She really believed in me. And um, she was always very helpful to me. So Gabby Gravilla, <laughs> um, my crazy Romanian. Uh, she's, she's Romanian. She's hilarious, though. Was this the call center job? Uh-uh. I was oh. working at a stucco supply company. Okay. With way too much fucking responsibility. Way too much. <laughs> way too much. You want me, me, who does not care. Listen, it was an amazing job. Because of that job, I had the money to do what I needed to do. And it was a salary job. Stepping stone. Right. So without that job, I wouldn't have been able to be, be able to afford to go to NACA. Or when I went out of town to do stuff, I wouldn't have been able to do it. But I was like, uh, I got, got the NBC thing while she was on vacation in Romania. And I was like, okay, I'm going to have to leave at the end of the month. Because for like... A lot, like my last day is this day because the first week of December, I got to go to LA. And they're like, all right. And then my college agent hit me up. It's like, hey, we got a last minute thing for you to do in Texas. And I was like, what? So you're telling me I can make my whole income for the month in an hour? Uh, <laughs> wait a second. Hey, Gabby, um, listen, I am not going to be able. To do it. And I was like, because we weren't sure it was going back and forth. So I found out like on Wednesday and she was like, you just got to send me an email. And my last day was Monday. How long were you at that job? I got that job February of 2014. Okay. 
So almost two years, which is crazy that I was there that long. But um, yeah, I worked there and it was like, it wasn't a stress, like it wasn't stressful all the time because there was a lot of times we weren't doing shit and we just make crafts. So. In that time, you also worked on the TV show Resurrection. Yeah, I point. did. What mm. was your experience with that and how'd that come into play? Resurrection was I got fired, sorry, <laughs> released from a temp assignment. Okay. Um, I got released from, this was 2013. I get released from a temporary assignment. So I got that job from, um, I had done a play for nine months back in like 2009. It was a, what the fuck is that play called? Sunday Afternoon at Lomans. And one of the guys that was in the show was helping with the casting for Resurrection for the first season. So he hit me up and was like, hey, what you doing? I'm like, being unemployed, what you doing? (laughs) And um, like literally, like I got released on Tuesday. The following Tuesday, I was on set. Mm. So one mm. of the girls texted me, "It's like, girl, you all right? How you doing?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm on the set of a TV show. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fucking good." And then a week later, I mean, not a week later, a month later, I did uh, my first Riggles picks. Yeah. With Rob Riggle for Fox NFL Sunday, and I got that through Sarah Tiana. Uh, Rob Riggle was here shooting um, Dumb and Dumber 2. And they contacted her like, look, we're going back to Atlanta. Do you know like black female comics we can use? And she's like, oh, I know somebody. And she gave them my name. And then I sent them my leak to Rooftop. And uh, they're like, yeah. And so they hit me up on Tuesday. Uh, Friday, I was on set. And then they asked me to come back the following week to do something else. Yeah, and these acting gigs are not by accident. A lot of people don't know. I mean, you've been an actor your entire life. Mm -hmm. I've been acting since I was a kid. Um, I've been SAG eligible since like 2007. Um, But yeah, I've been acting my whole life. I've done like commercials. Because that's the first time I ever went to LA was was to shoot a commercial. Oh, for what? For uh, African Pride. (laughs) Uh, So when my hair was still straight, because I did a com- I did one here, I did an infomercial here uh-huh. for African Pride, <laughs> and they paid me a thousand dollars to cut and relax and color my hair, and then they proceeded to put all of the weave in it. Mm-hmm. So, any black women listening, because I was in the box. Like they came up with this new perm with these herbs wow. and shit in it. Uh-huh. And I was on the coupon in the box. <laughs> African pride. African pride. But this was like fucking like 2009. But um, yeah. And then that job got bought by some Australian company because I was working at an insurance company. And they got bought and they started to downsize. And me and one of my friends were the first ones to get let go. Because we didn't have any kids. We didn't have any family. And we were like, you know, last hired, first fired. Mm -hmm. So uh, they let us go. And then I didn't do shit. I just hung out. Because this was before I... This was before I started doing... This was the year I started doing stand-up. So you're just sitting around with a theater degree? Just like, oh, I don't know what to do. Well, because I got... Because of me not working, I got booked. I booked the play. Oh, cool. And then I started doing stand-up. So at that time, I was just doing stand-up, and then I was just doing this play. Because it was at the Ansley Park Playhouse. So we got, you know, monies. Um, So, yeah, I was doing this play, and I was doing this play, and I was working. I was working. Mm -hmm. I was doing a play, and I started stand-up. Because I started stand-up May of 2009. And how did you land in Georgia? Because I think you've lived like kind of all around the country, haven't you? Like, yeah, in Miami I lived and Oklahoma. In, um, me and my mom were born in Miami. My father and my brother were born in Oklahoma. Um, and then my parents got divorced, and we moved to Colorado, and then we moved to Georgia. But all of those moves happened before I started kindergarten. Oh wow! So, and then I went to like. We lived in College Park. I went to school. My mother was like, fuck this. And then I went to school in East Point for a couple of months. My mother was like, fuck this. <laughs> so we lived in Austell. Mm-hmm. But um, I went to school in Sandy Springs. 
And then my brother went to daycare because I'm two, I was two years ahead of my brother in school. So we would get up in the morning. My mother would drop my brother off downtown for daycare. I would go to elementary school, like first grade in Sandy Springs. And then she would go to work in Norcross. Wow. And this was every morning. My mother just. My mother drove a Volkswagen Fox into the ground. <laughs> um, and then we would go, like visit my grandma on the weekends in Miami. So we would get off of school on Friday. My mother would drive a, like 11 hours to Miami just because she wanted to see her mom. And then <laughs> we would just, and then we'd drive back and we'd all be at school and at work on Monday. So did, did you grow up speaking Spanish? Or is this some, because I know you majored well, when, in Spanish as well. When we moved, so in 94, we moved after, no, 92, because it was after the hurricane. After Andrew, we moved back to Miami. Okay. And then in 95, we moved back. So, because my because we were going to move to Jamaica from my oh. mother's clothing business, but then my grandpa got sick. So we stayed with my grandpa, my grandpa passed, and then my mother was like, fuck it, we're going back to Georgia. Um, so we moved back here in 95 and we've been here ever since. And then I've lived in, uh, Pennsylvania, North Carolina for work. Cause I lived in Pennsylvania. I lived in Quakertown, Pennsylvania for three months doing summer stock. So summer stock, summer stock theater is, um, basically cause every year they have this thing called the Southeastern theater conference. And you go to the state theater conferences to get a number for SETC. And then you audition for professional theater companies for, you know, summer jobs or year-long jobs if you're about to graduate from college. And so because of, you know, me having technical theater experience through college and shit like that, between so my junior and senior year of college, I was in Quaker Town, Pennsylvania for three months. We did four musicals, 12 children's shows, and a children's camp. And then I was a technician as well. Jeez. So our day consisted of getting up, so we get up in the morning and then we would, because they we, they fed us. So, and we'd get breakfast, which is usually like, you know, a, uh, let's just say I lost 25 pounds in three months. <laughs> um, Water. Well, you know, it's like we would get breakfast and breakfast was like, you know, like some fruit. I mean, you couldn't have anything too heavy because you're going to work all day. Mm-hmm. So I get like, you know, like an apple and some peanut butter. And then I'd be in music rehearsal till lunch and then give us lunch, which was like, um, I think we called them foster home sandwiches. Um, and then we'd have dance rehearsal in the afternoon. Or they'd switch it, whichever one we needed to work on. And then, so you do music and dance during the day for one show. And then the evening, you'd perform a different show. Jeez. So when we first got there, we only rehearsed Barnum, which was the first show we did. And then after rehearsals in the evening... We would have children's show rehearsal because every Saturday was a different children's show. So out of the 12 children's show, I was in nine of them. I think in four of them, I was just a bird. (laughs) No lines or anything? Just emotive squawking. (laughs) Emotive squawking. Um, Because I think we did Jack and the Beanstalk, and Uh I was the golden goose. (laughs) And it was just me going, I was very scared. I wanted Jack to come get me. I was on the top of the staircase like, help me. But, you know, emotive squawking. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah. And then, so, so yeah. So, we would do, like, for instance, like, part of the summer, it was, like, and there was a children's camp as well. So, this is insane. So, like, in the morning, we did the music. So, in the morning, we practiced, like, the music for Barnum. And then the evening, no. No, how to succeed. So, random day. So how to succeed music in the morning, how to succeed dance in the e- in the afternoon, and then, you know, dinner, and then do a show. So we do Barnum. And then after that, we'd learn the Pied Piper. And then after that, I would work on sets and wigs and costumes or whatever. So I probably went to sleep like at two in the morning. And then we were just up because it was like all of us because we lived in the theater. Mm. So oh. a lot of us live there. So some of us, because like if there wasn't enough room for everybody, then other people lived like off site and like the board members' houses. But like my room, like if you exited stage right, 
my room was right there. Like you went through this door and then it was me and two other girls in this bedroom. And then there was like bunk beds. Yeah. I had a, like, it was, it says it was like a triple. There was bunk beds uh-huh. and there was my bed. Since I got there first, I got the single bed because yeah, yeah. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. He's seniority. But the rest yeah. of the rooms were, um, <laughs> some of the rooms were bunk beds and some of the rooms were just like twin beds. But there were like, I think like seven rooms upstairs. And then there were like, maybe like five rooms downstairs, but like make two, most of them were like two people, almost three people. Um, and we all lived there. We all lived there. And then, so when we started doing the children's camp, it was a music and dance rehearsal in the morning. And then the children's camp in the afternoon. And then there was a show. And then there was learning the children's and then learning the next show for the following, for that Saturday. And then still wigs and costumes and sets and shit. All running on the fuel of foster home sandwiches? All is that what you the, called them? Um, lunch was foster home sandwiches. Um, so basically, <laughs> uh, you know, bologna and cheese and cheese puffs. Mm-hmm. Until that beautiful day that uh, Leo found out that there was uh, a, a thousand packs of butter <laughs> in the freezer. So we uh, had grilled foster home sandwiches. Oh. You know, kids mm-hmm. are coming up. Yeah. And then every Friday before the show the board members would like get us dinner, usually like Boston Market or something. But any other night, the uh, the director of the theater company, like, because he had an apartment attached to the theater, which looked nothing like where the fuck we lived. You thought it was a completely different place. I'm uh-huh. like, is this <laughs> fucking Narnia? Like, what is this? The hell? And so he was, it was like a lot of pasta, like, you know, because it's, because he had to feed 30 people yeah. who had been dancing and singing all day long. But like we, but like, because that summer, <clears throat> I got to go to New York for the first time. Because we were like 30 minutes from Philly and we took the Peter Pan bus, which I had never fucking heard of. That was before Megabus. Right. It was before Megabus was the Peter Pan bus <laughs> that you took from like, I think, Allentown, Pennsylvania to mm-hmm. New York. And we went and I was just like, this is it. This is what you motherfuckers have been telling me about my whole life. Like, you weren't impressed? No, I felt like I was at Disneyland. All the rides were off. Like, <laughs> it's one of the ride of teacups. <laughs> Fuck y'all. So this is when your mom calls and is like, "Oh, hey, Dulce. By the way, I had a dream that you're supposed to be a famous comedian." That was. Oh, my mother told you about that, or I told you about that? Oh, I just knew about that. I know she told Two Shark about it. Um, shout out Two Shark Sting, nigga. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> he'll he, be on here too. He knows us with love. Yeah. Um, <laughs> He's in India right now. But um, basically, I was when I wasn't working in 2009, because me not working happens a lot, praise God. And uh, I was doing sketch and sketch works. And I did the first class. And Big Kenny had been after me for like two years to start doing stand-up. Because mm-hmm. a friend of mine worked at the Funny Farm. And I uh, would go up there just and hang out because I wasn't doing shit. And um, I would go there and hang out with her, and I just met Big Kenny, and then I met Quincy Bonds. And, you know, I would talk to them or whatever, and just from talking to them, they're like, oh, you're a comic. I'm like, no, I'm an actor. They're like, no, you are a comic. And I'm like, I don't know what fuck you're talking about. So I was like, no, I'm not doing it. They're like, you should go up on stage and write some jokes. I have no idea how to fucking, no idea how to do this. And stand up scared the shit out of me. Because <laughs> I grew up as an actor. Mm-hmm. So, like, anytime I was on stage, they weren't my words. It wasn't me. And there was a fourth wall. And I didn't have these things. So I was like, fuck you. This is insane. No, I'm doing this. You're crazy? No. <laughs> and then for two years straight, I kept running into Big Kenny. So I would go to like an event. Like I went to a fundraising event and Big Kenny was there performing with like Duty Brown. Or I'd go to another thing, like some walker, and he's there. Like I kept running into him. And I was like, why do I keep running into you? And he's like, it's fate, you dummy. And I was like, touche. Mm-hmm. And um, lose his job or whatever. So two years later, I'm taking the sketchworks class. And they asked me to do the next level of the class. And at the same time, Big Kenny had hit me up and was like, I got another stand-up class starting up. You need to do it. And I'm not kidding. And I was talking to my mom about it. And she's like, oh, I had a dream about you being a comic. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> She's like, I had a dream that you were a stand-up comedian and you were and you were performing. And I was like, all right, fine. I'll take a class. Fine. <laughs> but it was like, because the thing is, like, if your mom has a dream about something, 
you're yep. probably supposed to do it. Right. Exactly. Just, in, you know, Southern mysticism or <laughs> black, whatever. It's just like when your mom, like, like my freshman year of college, I was fucking around doing stuff I shouldn't have been doing. Like I was on drugs, but like we were hanging out places. We were, you know, hanging out with dudes we shouldn't have been hanging out with. Mm-hmm. We, were, we were doing shit we weren't supposed to be doing as like 18 year old girls. Very fuck. Like we could end up on the fucking news. Probably once or twice. Well, it was an all women's college. Well, it was a women's college, but like we were still in a town. Right. And so, and like we would go up to Athens and hang out. Like, you know, we're hanging out with dudes we didn't know. We're over at their house. Bah, da, da, da. Fucking dangerous. And so my mother called me up one day and was like, whatever you're doing, stop. And this is before self, like before everybody had a cell phone. This is my freshman year of college. So she calls my room phone and she's like, whatever you're doing, stop it. And I'm like, I'm not doing. And she's like, don't play with me. Whatever you're doing, cut it the fuck out. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then I went to all my friends and I was like, my mom said, shut it down. And they were like, what are you talking about? I was like, my mother just called me and said, whatever you're doing, stop it. And all my friends, you know, and it was talking to a group of black girls and they're like, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. What? We ain't going to, her mama just called her and told us to quit. Did she know about nothing? No. Oh no, fuck that. The Lord told her we ain't doing shit up. Nothing. Because with the other girl, she was like, we're going up. We were like, mm-mm. And Wait, did you stop? Me. Yeah, stop. Your yeah. mother calls you out of nowhere and tells you to sit the fuck down. <laughs> that had to be the Lord going, your daughter's in danger. Tell her to chill the fuck out. And that's exactly what I did. I was like, I'm not going anywhere. I'm doing shit. But I'm, I'm, look, I go where these white girls are going. We are doing some dumb shit. <laughs> and then sometimes with them, you didn't fucking know. Because I got to go be a bouncer down at Georgia Tech with these broads. <sighs> a bouncer? I was friends with, like, I had three groups of friends in college. I had all my black friends, and then I had theater friends, and then I had my sorority friends. And so, like, they would go down and party at, like, Georgia Tech. And so we were partying at frat houses at Georgia Tech. And we've all seen a Lifetime movie. Um, So (laughs) I spent a lot of time making sure my friends didn't end up in Lifetime movies. Right. Because they were, because, like, they would pull some shit with them. They wouldn't pull some shit with me. Oh, you were like the mother of the group almost. Always, always. One of my friends ended up in a very scary situation, which consisted of me yanking a dude off of her and throwing him down some stairs. Mm. And from then on, it was like, okay, Mama Dulce. Like this is, because I started getting called Mama Dulce in high school. Mama Dulce. In high school. Wow. And I never told anybody to call me that. And then again in college and now with like the younger comics. They call me that. I never tell anybody to call. I never go, call me Mama Dulce. Because I'm a fuck. Why would I do that? Why would I tell people, like, listen, I'm 32. Can you start calling me Mama? (laughs) Well, that's now going to be the title of this episode. I'll punch you in your mouth. (laughs) I'll punch you in your whole mouth. Mama Dulce. Well, it's good genetics because your mom clearly has good instincts telling you to stop messing around and to start stand up. Well, yeah. And I was, because, like... If it wasn't for, like, all those meetings, like, all the opportunities that I've gotten mm-hmm. and, like, being able to, like, sit with NBC and meet with, like, the different networks I've been able to meet with is because of stand-up. Mm-hmm. Like, I wouldn't have been able to get in the room with any of those people if I would have kept acting. Where, and I know that, so. Where was your first performance outside of the grad show? Like, because you had, you, your first time performing was the graduation show of your class. Right. So then where did you start performing around the city after that? So, yeah, and then I just went up, like, because when I first started, I did any room I can do. So, like, I was doing urban rooms. I was doing mainstream rooms. I was just trying to get up wherever I could get up. So, and then it just got to the point where I was, like, I was getting more opportunities to go up in mainstream rooms. So, I just was, like, I'm not driving all over the fucking city. This is insane. I got work in the morning. I could just go to these, main like, white rooms. And my name is on the list. I know I'm going to get up. Mm-hmm. So, I just stuck with those rooms. And I just dealt with less shit in those rooms. So that's what I did. I mean, that's what I stuck with. And that's what, like, and I'm glad I did it because I got the opportunity to really, like, because I still go back and, like, do those other shows. But it got to the point where I was getting so many shows in the mainstream rooms that I was, like, it got to the point where nobody really knew who I was in the urban room. In the urban room. But a lot of people that... (laughs) Do urban rooms in Atlanta have a story of getting booed? You know, do you have one of those? I got a no. I've gotten quiet. (laughs) 
<laughs> Which you've never you gotten can, booed. You can get out of quiet. You can't get out of booed. You never got booed. I've not been booed in an urban room. I've gotten quiet in an urban room. Okay. Which is even weirder. Okay. Because it's like y'all don't care. <laughs> it's not because the thing is, if you're if you boo, then you know you don't like it. If you're quiet, then you're just trying to figure out what the fuck's going on. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the quiet that's weird. Like, I'm like, if I'm booed, cool, thank you, you don't like it. If you're quiet, I'm like, all right, well, let me try something else. And it's still quiet. I'm like, all right, fuck the crowd work. Like, it isn't, that's what I just have to do. But yeah, if you're, if I've mean, not gotten booed, but I've gotten quiet. Do you think, I know you've said growing up, you sometimes felt like you weren't, quote, black enough. Did you feel like that in the urban rooms as well? No, I never said that I didn't feel like I was black enough. Other black people would say I wasn't black oh, enough. Oh, okay, okay. I was as black as I was going to be because I'm black. So right. there's no, <laughs> this is as black as I can, like, this is as black as I occur. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if being black is being uneducated, if being black is being poor, if being black is all of these negative things, then I'm not going to co-sign to that because I know that's not what being black is. It's whatever I am. So, you know, the idea of not black enough is something that was invented by other black people and then taken on by white people to fuck with me at auditions. Oh, so, geez. right. So it's, you know, I didn't run, I ran into, I would have male comics say to me, Oh, don't say ain't fuck with you. You fuck with them white boys. And I'm like, are you talking about me doing shows? You're talking about me actually fucking white boys. What are you mm -hmm. saying? Um, and it's like, oh, you know, you, you know, it was because Big Kenny, Big Kenny told me when I started, he was like, don't let, don't let urban comics pressure you, make you feel bad about not doing those rooms because you need to do those rooms. Meaning, don't make me feel bad about not doing urban rooms because I'm doing mainstream rooms. You know, don't let them make you feel bad. Don't let them, you know, try to pressure you or fuck with you about the fact that you're not out there with them when you're out there working. You're just on doing other rooms. And it was funny because, like, in, like, 2012, like, every Black comic that I knew almost was like, don't say, how I get in these white rooms? How I get in these white rooms? And I'm like, show up. Right. That is it. Mm -hmm. It's not a, me there's no keypad to, there's no, <laughs> you don't have to decode any, there's no cheat codes. Just come to the show. And because I never, I understand why there is a divide. I get it. Because when you go to places like Texas and when you go to places like Los Angeles or, you know, there are Hispanic, like there's Latin rooms, there's Mex there's flat out Mexican rooms. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole other circuit of stand-up that we don't know about because we don't have those comics here. We don't have the population here where they have their own club. So there's a reason that there's division. Because we find because there's a different what's the word I'm trying to say? Like there's a different sensibility. Cause like, you know. You know, in an urban room, you have to have a laugh every 30 seconds. We all know that. Mm. I've been in mainstream rooms. The fucker has a two-minute setup. And you're like, this is unnecessary. No matter what the fuck room you're in, tell <laughs> right. the damn joke. Mm -hmm. Unless they're, because like, so when I have longer bits, I have little jokes in the longer bit. So the crowd's not going, well, what the fuck is this bitch's point? Like, or anytime I see somebody, any comic with a long setup, I'm like, this punch better make somebody flip a fucking table because <laughs> this is too long. This is too long. Why am I sitting? Why have I gone a minute and a half and not laughed yet? What are you talking about? So see, even you are seeing comics that don't do 30 second punchlines and you're like, well, speed it up. Well, it's if you're not going to, that's what I'm saying. If you are, if you have a longer setup, I don't have a problem with a longer setup. It, it needs to be, an, an even if there's not a laugh in the setup, mm -hmm. it needs to be an entertaining setup. Right. I need to be engaged with your setup. Because there are some comments I don't know, they're very funny and they have longer setups, but I'm engaged. If you're just talking for a minute and a fucking half and this could have taken 45 seconds, then you're just terrorizing the audience. Yeah. So if you're going to have a longer setup, it needs, just be, be engaging, not entertaining, be engaging with it. 
make me want to hear what the next thing is. So, yeah, there's different sensibilities. There's the things that they talk about. Because sometimes, like, I can go to white rooms and go, fuck, these white boys are talking about the exact same thing. <laughs> Every fucking white boy is talking about the exact same fucking thing. <laughs> when white boys start standing up, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to talk about. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but when I go to urban rooms, it's the same thing. It's like everybody's talking about the same shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's like no one else, ex- y'all don't do nothing. What the fuck do you people do? Like, <laughs> do you know, how do you walk in nature? Why are y'all all talking about the same thing? And like, because you sometimes like I sit back and look, I'm like, there's so many fucking comics. Because like, yeah, like Skull Festival, like 400 people applied to do Skull Festival. Mm-hmm. And they took 72. And you're like, who, who applied? Because, you know, I remember when I was- Were you not impressed with the talent in the festival? No, what I'm saying is like, that's a lot of fucking, like 400 comics. Mm -hmm. Because the comics who were in the Skull Festival were great. Because there's been other years of the Skull Festival when I've been like just hanging around and being backstage. And there were definitely comics that didn't want other comics to do well so they could go to the next round. Right. This year, everybody wanted everyone to do well so they can feel like they earned their spot if they moved on. So I was glad of the people that they had this year because they were good comics. They were nice people. But 400, fu- where for? Ah, 400 comics. Comedy's blown up right now. That's a lot of motherfuckers. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? There's so many fucking people are comics and you're like, but there's people applying to festivals that are like, I've been doing stand-up for six months. I should go to a festival. Right. Fucking chop yourself in the throat. Yeah. No, you shouldn't. Because when I'm like, when Baron Vaughn was in town the other week, he was talking about this joke he has about like groups of like animals. So he's, because we were talking about different groups of animals. Like, oh, a group of crows, like a murder of crows or like a pod of dolphins. And I said, what's a group of comics? <laughs> and he was like, it's an entitlement. A group of comics is an entitlement of comics. <laughs> and I almost fell down in the yeah. street when we were walking back to the car. <laughs> and I was like, I was exactly right. Yeah. I was exactly right. Because when I first started, in, I started to stand up six and a half years ago. There were no shows on Tuesday. There were no shows on Thursday. No mainstream room on Tuesday and Thursday. There were no shows on the, you, could, you were expected to be at a club. Wow. On the weekends to watch and learn. And that's just six and a half years ago. And that's six and a half years ago. Now there's, four, like, I could do four shows on a Tuesday. Yeah. But on Monday, still, it's still Star Bar. Like, st- and then they had that, you know, and then um, Ben Palmer had the room at the, uh, at hole, that bar. Hole, hole in the wall. wall. Yep. This show still going on? No. Okay. No. Um. So I've seen stuff change and then relapse. Ugh. Relapse, amazing. Yeah, and then the R.I.P. Wh- oh, that sad was, faces. Um, that was the first time I saw the Dulce Sloan oh in the shining light when you closed out the show, and like you just, just like the confidence and like your persona. Even back then, you know, this was probably like this was when I was hosting the open mic there. So I mean, this was maybe like three or four years ago now, maybe. And I remember oh, yeah. seeing you, and like as soon as you got off stage and I closed out the show, I was like. I need to talk to you. <laughs> what was that? How did, what did and you like took me through your notebook? You're like, well, this is what I did here. And you like, that was the first time we really talked was like, we were just standing there at the bar, not drinking, just looking at your notebook. And I was like, that was amazing. Like your confidence. And it seems like, I guess from the theater background is just that you've never, you're not afraid of silence. And like, you just, you just can milk it. And you just like, just roll in that there's silence. Two, there's two kinds of silence. There is silence. Cause we're listening. Mm-hmm. And silence because we don't know what's going on. Um, it's very rare that I get the... Because that's the one thing that's happened to me like in black rooms. It's like, if they are not on board, they just don't say anything. <laughs> Which is like, what the fuck do I do with this information? I thought I was going to get booed. At least some type of reaction. But silence is like, hmm. All right, well, she going to be done soon. <laughs> like, what the fuck? But it's... But I had to learn how to work with silence. I had to learn how to work with my tone. Um, because some like the best thing you can do sometimes for a rowdy crowd is lower your voice. Okay. Um, and I figured that out. I was at I think I was one of those shows in McDonough where I just 
There was a good three months where I quit writing set lists because I kept getting interrupted. <laughs> because my style is so conversational, people feel like I'm talking to them. <laughs> so people want to engage me in conversation and then I have to embarrass some dad and McDonough on a Tuesday night um, or wherever we were doing a show. So I had to figure out like with a loud crowd, like a drunk crowd, I would just lower my voice and increase my intensity. And then people would go, well, what did, what did she say? What the shit? And they get quiet because they're trying to figure out what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. So you're drunk having this conversation. If I'm talking at a regular volume, you'd want to, you know, oh, I can figure out what she's saying. I can, ha, 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 you know. But if I'm too quiet, you're like, well, you can't tune me out because you don't know what I'm saying. So it's like, well, fuck, what is she? And then I can bring it back up if I want or I'll just stay at that level. But... I had to learn very quickly because like I've done shows like I was in a show in college for a 900 seat house and there's no mics because the theater was over a hundred years old. Yeah. And you have to get your voice to the back of that room. And I was playing a mountain God. And so I'm on a six, so I was on an eight foot platform that was f- like a square that was five by five. So, and I was up there at the beginning of the show. So I sat, this, the children's show was only 45 minutes. And so I sat on this platform on this mountain for 30 minutes. And then a CO2 thing goes off and then I break open a mountain and then I stand up. And so, and I'm on a mountain and then there's other set pieces and then I'm a mountain god. So I am giving Hippo the ability to swim. And I... And it's further back. So I have to make my presence known in front of all of this set, in front of people dancing in costume, and then a seat of 900 and everyone in the audience is between kindergarten and the fifth grade. And I have to make all of you pay attention. So I had to learn very quickly, okay, how do I have the presence to get everyone in this room to pay attention to me. It helps to pop out of a mountain with a CO2 canister, Mm -hmm. but I can't tote mountains with me to shows. (laughs) So I I learned from theater how to, because all all the comics would ask me when they first start out, like, how do I have presence on stage? And the main thing I would say to people is plant your feet. Quit moving. Mm. Because if you see me on stage, you realize I'm I'm in a spot and I don't deviate. I find my light and I stand there. Because usually your microphone is in your life. I move if I have to. Um, Because a lot of comics like to pull the whole Chris Rock pacing thing. Sweetie, not everybody's good at that. (laughs) And you've only been doing stand-up for three months. So you need to fucking be still. Because if you're walking back and forth. Because the thing about Chris Rock is set up, set up, set up, punchline still. Set up, set up, set up, punchline still. Yeah. You don't know that he does that because you just started. Be still. Be still. It's it. Because if you're going to stay, if you, once you stand in your, like, you stand in your light. It's called finding your light for a reason. You stand in your light. You get the microphone. That's when you create your presence on stage. Because if you see people when they first start out, the stage is bigger than them. So some people get swallowed up by a stage. But if you can be still and focused, then you'll start to fill up the stage just by yourself. And that's what, because that's the main thing comics have to learn is even if you're on a fucking pallet at a brewery, you have to not fit. That stage is not your stage. The entire wall you're standing in front of is the stage. This entire brewery is a fucking stage. So I have to be able to fill up this entire brewery. I'm not, st- I'm not thinking about this spot. People in the back have to give a shit. Drunk broad on the side has to pay attention. So that's the point. Every time you get on stage, it's not... I don't like when comics say, oh, I'm a comic because I'm fucked up. All of this getting up on stage, doing stream of consciousness, bitching about your life. Where the fuck is the joke? Terrorism. Stop it. (laughs) I'm dead ass. Yeah. You got an entire audience full of, you got a room full of people in here and other people have to go up after you. And you are selfish enough to get on fucking stage and whine about your life and and not make it jokes. Killing everybody's time. Killing everybody's time. Yep. If you're going to bitch about your life, at least tell a fucking joke. And that's what's great about your stand-up is that there are jokes 
in there. I mean, it's hilarious. Thank you. First, I have, I mean, people love you. My mom, I'm supposed to say my mom says hi. Hi, mommy. Uh, Your mom's nice. My She's mom, pretty. And yeah, and you, you'll you like swear during her show and like she'll like cringe when she hears swear words. But like she's like, I don't, when Dulce cusses, it just, I don't, it just warms me. I don't know. <laughs> well, my mother says I've been cussing since the age of five. <laughs> and she says, she said to me yesterday, she said, you say motherfucker the way you did when you were a little girl. Yeah. And I was like, really? She said, you always hit that TH real hard. <laughs> I was like, thank you, mom. Yeah, there's a music to it. And also with your stand up, there is this. I don't know if call it persona, but you, you can't say there's like the sassy black woman and you having a theater background. How much of your standup is you playing that character? See, and the problem is that I don't want to be that character. That's not the person I'm trying to be. And whenever I get auditions or whenever I do something, I have to go, is this the stereotype? Is this a real human? It, you know, is this, or am I just playing up on something that, you know, white people are fucking afraid of? But at the same time, it's like, oh, this is, you know, like when I did that thing for Riggles Picks and I was like Postmaster Monique or whatever. Yeah. And I'm going through the lines. At one point, they're like, we need you to be more sassy. I said, excuse me? What do you mean? And they're like, we just need a little bit more sass. I'm like, this is as sassy as I get. How about y'all relax? <laughs> And he was like, that, do that. That's perfect. I was like, hey, man, <laughs> fuck you. Wow. But we'd been, we'd go, we'd had enough takes and stuff where I'd, you know, got a rapport with them. I'm not yelling, fuck you to directors I just met. Right, right, Because right. I want to work again. <laughs> but, um, because it's like, and this is the thing that's conflicting about that. Because it's like, oh, you don't want to be sassy black woman. You don't want to be this person. But yet, I've still seen the lady going off on somebody in a post office. So, am I playing a stereotype? Is she playing a, like who the what's this? Who's the stereotype? So, because you know, there's sassy black woman, there's angry black woman, but me, it's just I'm talking to you with intent. I'm telling you that I care about this. So, because I remember like Joe Galois, hi Joe, would joke. He was like, uh, <laughs> he's like, oh, you should call your first comedy all ass class and sass. And I was like, that's hilarious. And I remember uh, I was doing, it was uh, like three years ago, and I was doing shows with Baron Vaughn at the Skull. Mm -hmm. And we were joking about this, and Baron was like, absolutely not. No. Never. Do not do that. And we're like, oh, we were just joking around. He's like, fuck, no. Do not do that. He was like, because that's what you're going, he said, they're always going to see you as that. Don't give that to them. It has to be something stronger than that. It has to tell. He said, if you're doing that, then you might as well just be any other. You can start any other black woman into that. Mm -hmm. It has to be something where people are going to go, oh, she is different. Or, you know, oh, this is something that something that's catchy, something that's like something that's like not a typical thing. So I'm always trying to make sure like when I get auditions and stuff, it's like, oh, I'm black best friend. Of course. But. What kind of black best friend? Like, am I the black best friend that's like, yeah, white girl, you know, your life is so hard. Uh-huh, chicken hot sauce. Like, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> it's Or is it, am I black best friend or am I your friend who's black? Okay. That's two different things. Because mm -hmm. it's like, you don't want to extract the fact that, you know, it's, oh, she's, you know, She's got a, you know, she's got a big personality and all this other shit, but there's a difference between sassy black woman and girl with a big personality. So I try, like, when I'm on stage, I'm not, that's not, and, and, you know, and usually white people say that to me, and I usually have to go, that's not, that's not what I'm doing. I am being, like, these are my thoughts. This is the way that I relate these thoughts. Because it's funny because it's like with me doing those college shows, hmm. my college agent was like, I love your, she's like, I love your, you know, personality and your intensity with your jokes. She said, just make it a little lighter. Just make it a little happier. Smile more. She said, say exactly what you're saying, hmm. but just a little less. She's like, I was like, less attitude. She's like, yes, just bring it up. Just smile more. Mm -hmm. And just, because like sometimes I'll do my set and I'll drop my tone down. I get very intense. And she's like, just come up. She said, you can still be a little intense, but like intensity as opposed to <laughs> intensity. Like just bring it up. And so I have to be conscious of when I do those shows, 
and of the audience of okay, I can't can't scare these kids. Like <laughs> that's I mean that's what I have to pay attention to. But no, sassy black women is something that I constantly fight. Uh yeah. T because I, <laughs> I mean you you know you have the joke about your mom teaching you the white voice and you'll go like from sassy to like the white voice and it's like I've heard you say you know you don't want to be a caricature. Right. You know of a black woman and everything, right. but it's like I've seen I've seen you be sassy but I've also seen you have a double quinceañera where yeah, you sure. have a, a matching American girl doll yes, and a I did. court full court escort. Yep. So it's like those two worlds, you know, I mean, are you trying to find middle ground? I mean, I mean, it's all of those things are me. Like the idea for the first of all, okay. I know people don't know what the fuck you mean by a double quinceañera. I'm so sorry. For, <laughs> I'm sorry. That was for my 30th birthday. For people don't know, for my 30th birthday, like I don't know if anyone knows what a quinceanera is. Um, it's difficult to spell, so just type in quince um, to the internet, and it'll tell you it's a big birthday celebration for when you know a Latina turns 15. So I had a joke with one of my mom's friends. Um, no, with one of my friends' moms, that for my 30th birthday I would have a doble quinceanera, and she has four sons, so she never had a king say or none of that stuff for her kids because she didn't have any daughters. So, and we were joking about this. We came up with this idea when I was like 24. And like six years later, I hit up my friend. I'm like, tell your mom I'm having this party. And she comes, she's like, do you want to say I thought you forgot all about me? And I was like, no, Maria, I made sure you came. But um, I was like, plus this was your idea. So, but for me, that wasn't something that was ridiculous for me because when you were at the party, mm-hmm. you were like, okay, my Cuban family's here, my Mexican family's here, my black family's here, my white family couldn't make it. Yeah. So, but those are all people that were supportive of me. But the funny thing is the only people in that room who were actually related to me were my mom and my brother. My actual blood related family, that my black family, that's all my mama's friends and stuff from Miami that live here now. None of my blood related family was at this thing. Um, it's because like my family lives oh, very far and we're not very close. Because like the uncle we're actually closest to lives in Las Vegas. I got three other uncles we don't fucking talk to. And then my father had no siblings. So my family is very small. And all of my grandparents, all of my grandparents are, have passed away. So my family is very small. And so. People bring you in. And so that's what it was for me is like going, okay, this is to acknowledge all of the people who have taken care of me, who have brought me in. That's why I did that. But, and also I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> and I thought I'd come up with this original idea. Nope, some bitch had already done it. But she didn't do it like I did it. All she had was like a fucking party in her backyard with like oh, some margaritas yeah. and shit. The bitch didn't have no dresses. She didn't have dama. She didn't have chamblades. I worked the shit out. There was a roast. There was a roast. Yeah. Um, which was funny because some of the people on the roast were like, well, we really wanted to roast you, but we didn't want you to get mad at us. And I was like, it's a fucking roast. Right. Yeah. So, because people still talk about you <laughs> and Joe Gawa on that roast. But um, I don't think those are different. I don't think those are different things. Because, like, I grew up with a lot of, like, my neighbors growing up in Gwinnett were mostly Hispanic, mostly Latino, mostly Mexican. And so... I was always at my neighbor's houses because, like, I le- I learned Spanish when we moved. Because I knew you asked me this earlier. When we moved to Miami in '92, I was like in the fourth grade, and in Miami, you learn like you know you have like art, music, and PE in elementary school. You take Spanish as well every single day, and so every single day for fourth and fifth and half of sixth grade, I took Spanish. Mm. And I wanted to learn it. So I was always like, I got to get as much as this as I could possibly get to the point, like in the fifth grade, I was like, I would translate documents from my teacher. Um, what was her name? Senora Mayorga. Haha. <laughs> but she would get stuff like paperwork, like teacher shit in her teacher box from the school. And she'd be like, do say? Come here. And she'd be like, what's this say? And so I have to translate into Spanish. So I was like, oh, well, they want you to do this. You have to do this. And this is this, and this is some other shit. Like I was, you know, some words I didn't know, but mm-hmm. I'd give her the gist of it. And then that's what I did when I got when we moved into Norcross in the seventh grade. Like I said, register my neighbor's kids for school, 
which I did not know at a 14 year old you could register. Yeah. Children for school. Mama Dulce. Apparently. <laughs> um, I would register my neighbor's kids for school. One of my neighbors had to get um, health insurance from her job. She was working as a uh, housekeeper at a hotel. So I came home from, I think I was in college at this point, and I went with her to her job and helped her register for her health insurance. Um, her na- her husband got a DUI and had to explain legally shit to her. Wow. And a lot like of a hands on learning, right? Like family. hands on, like telling yeah. them what's going on. And then just from growing up, like all of my, a lot of my friends were like Latin, you know, especially like in high school. And like, cause, you know, if you know Spanish, because like I think there's so many people in my high school, fuck, like everybody in my fucking high school knew Spanish. Black, it was white, a very Spanish. diverse high school. It was school. a very diverse high school. Yeah. And so, like, our teachers knew if they were getting cussed out in 12 different languages. <laughs> Dead serious. Mm-hmm. Like, you just like, oh, because if you go, you know, you go put that to your teacher now, she knows what you're saying. But, like, our teachers knew if they were getting called a bitch in Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, Romanian, Russian, German. Like, our teachers had to fucking know. Listen, I don't know what the <laughs> fuck you just said, but it sounded wrong. <laughs> but yeah, because some kid said, like, called our teacher a bitch in, like, Romanian. She was like, oh, you don't think I know what that means? Come here. And he got written up for calling her a bitch in Romanian. <laughs> well, all these people that are close to you and all these different cultures that know you personally, when they see your stand-up, do they see the sassy black woman or do they see Dulce? They see me. Okay. And I only harp on it because... I've I've heard you like battled this before and like no I'm not the sassy black woman but then it like it seems like you are playing this character and the mm-hmm, you it seems like you lean into that stuff a lot. I think it's sometimes I do it if it's I don't always find like I think that's a character for people who are outside my culture. Um, because like I had a friend in college who I was on the phone with my mom one day and she was just laughing. I was like, what the fuck are you laughing about? She's like, you've been on the phone with your mom for 30 minutes. And all I've heard was, mm, mm, mm-hmm. But I'm talking to my, but it's like, um, because if you're just quiet, mm. she thinks the fucking phone call dropped. So mm. I have to say something to let her know that I'm still on the phone. But if I'm hanging out with one of my black friends and I hear her on the phone with her mom or whoever, she's going, mm, I know, like, mm, mm. okay, she's talking to somebody black. So it's, I only get called sassy by white people. Okay. I don't get called sassy by black people. I don't get called angry black woman by black people. I've been called angry by black people when I was fucking mad. (laughs) But like, that's the one part of black women that white people, white men can understand. Oh, they're so sassy and funny. But like, that's the part that white people get. It sounds like casting agents seem to put you in that small space as well. They put every black person. Like, that's why you have movies like Bamboozled. That's why you have the characters written on TV that you have. Like, I did a... But then I'm now in this weird... Now I'm in this weird place because it's like... Um, I read for a pilot. And um, the casting director... Because I'd already sent in a tape in for it before. They liked my tape. And they're like, oh, we're doing live casting. So come and, you know, come and read. And um, the casting director happened to see me on the NBC showcase. She didn't know I was on it. She was like, I saw your tape. It seemed like you were acting. Of course, I was fucking acting. Mm-hmm. It's a tape. Um, she said, I liked your tape. It seemed like you were acting. I just want you to be yourself. And I was like, oh, okay. But in my brain, I'm like, how the fuck do I do that? <laughs> how do I do that? Like, it goes against 12 years of acting training. She was literally like, say these lines. She's like, you know, I liked how you, she's like, I liked the personality that I saw on stage. And I was like, okay, cool. That's me. Because mm-hmm. I tell my jokes. Because the thing is, it's like when I'm on stage, it's a performance I'm putting on a show. Even the best comic has to turn. You you can't perform constantly. Yeah. That heightened sense, that being aware of every, that being in control of the room, you can't be that person all of the time. But that's what casting agents expect you to do as well. And that's And so I have to realize that the person that I am when I'm on stage is not that it's not me. It's not like it's a Larry the Cable Guy situation where this is a totally different human. Mm-hmm. That's me, but that is me being able to say what I want to, what I being able to say what I'm thinking and what I want to say in the way that I want to say it. 
Because I could totally just be as nice and sweet and say those jokes. Because I've done it. Um, Or I could be really low key with those jokes. Because I've done that. Or I can be completely over the top because I'm on a fucking showcase. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> like when you like when she saw me on that showcase, I was in fucking battle mode. Right, right. Like the goal is to make sure that no one else in this motherfucker wins but me. So it is going to be too much. It is going to it's going to be over the top. It's still me. I'm not sh- I'm not you know rolling my neck or whatever. Because that's why I say in that joke, I'm trying to get a white dude. It's like, no, 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 no. I'm one of the nice ones. Mm-hmm. Like, ah, don't be, don't be scared. It's okay. <laughs> Come on, white dude. I'm one of the nice ones. Like, look, my neck doesn't even move when I talk. Come on. <laughs> Come on. So in the middle of that joke, I'm talking about that these are the stereotypes that they have for us. Mm-hmm. White man, calm down. I'm not one of those. Like, you see what I'm saying? But the fact that, and like some people, only black people catch that I say that in that joke. People, white people catch that I'm now saying I'm one of the nice ones. Some of them do. Some of them catch it and don't want to laugh. Black people always fucking laugh. <laughs> and only certain white people catch, you know, oh, I'm one of the nice ones. My neck doesn't even move when I talk. Black people always catch that. White people occasionally and the ones that catch it don't want to laugh. So it's, I still have to put, because it's like, I have to make sure that I'm not what they say that I am. But I have to realize that that person is a, like, that person's a person. Like this sassy black girl going off, popping her, da, da, da. I've seen that. I've seen that chick. So what do I do? Get that chick to go to fucking college so I get better casting to sit? Like that's, mm-hmm. that's too much. I have to, like, I have not fix. I have to change the entire, the way every single black woman acts so I can get better casting calls. That's insane. But you have to realize, okay, is she the stereotype? Am I the stereotype? Are you assholes for writing this this way? Who's wrong? But a lot of times when I get stuff, I'm like, we don't talk this way. Mm. We don't act like this. I don't know what you thought. This is unrealistic. No black person acts that way. But then you, you know, you're like, okay, well then who? How do, well, how would you do it? I'm like, I do it like I do it. And that's so, good to have that confidence so early on in navigating this world because that's kind of a new step in your career. You can right. get on stage, but now you have to figure out, you know, that whole network and how to act. And I know someone you learned a lot from Holly about Hollywood from was like Margaret Cho. Oh, well, I've talked to her a few times. Like we've met a little bit. I'm doing this B. Robin show um, that she's doing. It's a benefit show for the homeless. She put she started doing it after Robin Williams passed away. Because, you know, she considers him one of her comedy fathers. Like, mm-hmm. he took care of her. Just like Joan Rivers is one of her comedy mothers. And I've always looked up to her. And, you know, just from knowing her history and just a few times that I've talked to her and met her and knowing what she went through in the industry. As an Asian woman. As an Asian woman, as a woman who didn't fit the, you know, blonde, blue-eyed, you know, slim-ass stereotype. It's you're always like, and as a woman, you're fighting and as a black woman, you're fighting and you're like, this is exhausting. Mm. So I just have to make sure, okay, what is my fight? What is my fight? To make sure that everything that I'm in, that I'm not the sassy black woman to know that as a woman who's not a size six, that I can be portrayed as sexy on something, that I can be seen as an object of attraction, as an object of affection, to know that just because I'm not thin doesn't mean I don't deserve love. Like, that is one of the reasons that I do that broad joke. So is that your overall goal is to really... Because, I mean, you you clearly have high expectations for yourself, as you should. Right. As you completely should. I mean, you're extremely talented and you've you. achieved so much in such a, a short comedy career. So is your goal overall as a dual say... Thank Sloan, you. like, are you looking to, like, break a mold and really blaze a trail for women to follow you? I just want me to be okay. But there's someone I want to look up to. And then when I listen, you know, because I saw Margaret in Montreal. And, you know, there is activism in her set. Right. And that's something because, like, I feel like I'm not that much of an activist but I'm still trying to show people I'm a whole person. 
So you can see like, oh, you know, she's funny. She's sad. Oh, her hair. But a lot of my jokes are, look at what you're doing to me. Mm-hmm. You're putting your hands in my hair. You are saying fucked up stuff to me. Like, look at, like, well, li- listen to what I'm saying. This is what you're doing. Like, men, you are telling me I'm too fat to date. You are yelling at me from across the street. You are too afraid to talk to me for whatever fucking reason because society told you you're supposed to be. Sounds like some activism, Miss Sloan. I mean, it's just like, um, I'm, I'm, but I'm, I don't have any jokes about this. So it's like, that's why the joke about feminism is like, I don't fucking get it. Like, y'all want equal pay for equal work. That is totally accurate. But I don't want to fucking work. I don't. <laughs> I don't like this, <laughs> like this, like stand up and all of this. I do this because I love this, but I know I have to make sure this shit stays on point so I can pay all of my bills. But if I can find some nice man who will pay for all of this shit, I'm totally fucking fine with that. I have no problem being a trophy wife. The only thing is I talk too much. You clearly have, you know, more than just all right, if somebody will pay for this. I mean, you have stars tattooed on your body. You're not aiming for the middle here. No, I'm not aiming for the fucking middle. Yeah, I got stars tattooed on my body because, you know, I'm a fucking star. And your mom dreamed you were a star. Right, and this, she calls me, this is, I have these because my mom calls me a star. Okay. Like, I have these things because this is my nickname, the star on my foot is a star that's broken in half and one side's comedy, one side's tragedy. I know who I am. I know the lane that I run in. I know I'm going to have to work for my money. I know that. I've known since I was a child that I was going to have to work. I knew that. Me being able to do, me being able to do what I want to do is a blessing. Me having to sit in someone's day job was a means to an end. Mm-hmm. If I could have got married at 22 and I had to fucking work and still had to do this, my career would be on a completely different trajectory. But I would also have a different mindset in what I have to do. Because on top of still doing stand-up and then I'm still doing and then you know I'm trying to keep doing sketch because I've gotten really busy, but I also have a jewelry business. Yeah. I just did a kid's birthday party too, like a month ago. So there's other things that I do because I need all of these things to be me. So in the same thing where you were saying like, you know, there's this part of you and then there's this part of you. All of those things are me. No one knows I'm a giant fucking nerd. No one has any idea that my dream role in a movie is to be a Cleon in a Star Trek movie. <laughs> no one knows that. They do now. Thank you. I, You know what I just did yesterday? I watched... Craft in America on PBS, and then I made shit. And your jewelry business is called Star Jewelry, right? It's, yeah, it's called Estrella. It's it's means star in Spanish, but it's spelled how my brother spells it. Um, it's spelled phonetically. My mother calls me that. That's the name of my, you know, it's the name of my business. You know, I have a production company. I'll probably call that too. But when you have a production company, I'm gonna have to have a production company. Boom. Because I'm gonna have to do stuff. Because there's so many people like. The thing is, it's not like 30 years ago where all you had was the networks and then cable. You know, Netflix is doing original programming. Hulu and Amazon are doing original programming. People have fucking YouTube channels doing original stuff. So it doesn't, because, you know, you might, okay, I got a pilot and it's not good, but then I'm picking it up because for whatever reason, or, you know, things aren't going the way you wanted to go and just be like, fuck it, I'll do it. Come to me with it. And I'll put it on whatever the fuck I need to do it with. But I also need to be able to have my money make money. So I still got to have, my mother's always about different revenue streams. Because like, my mother's like, okay, let's do this with makeup. Or let's do this with this. Or let's do this. Or, you know, we've got the jewelry. Well, why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do makeup? Why don't you do this? Because it's all about, you got to have multiple revenue streams. Mm -hmm. And Tone Bell talked about on on Hot Breath, uh, this show, Mm -hmm. that uh, he had a check for like 150000 that when it finally trickled down to him, he had 19,000. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So everybody tune into that episode. That's posted up right now. So I like I like your approach is that you want you want to be the power. Yeah. You want and that like I asked you earlier, you want to be paving a paving a path for people. You want to be the vehicle for people to you know, be their own stars. Even when I was had a day job, I was doing a play and doing st- like the play ran Thursday through Sunday. I did shows Monday through Wednesday. Mm-hmm. and then did the play and then still had work during the weekdays. So I can do that and still be like, well, shit, I need to do something for my jewelry business. Or fuck, I need to do this or I need to do this. And I never feel like I'm doing enough stuff. That's that panic from comics. Like, fuck, you got heat. I got to do this right now. I got to do this right now. I got to do this right now. And then I have my manager going, it's not like that. Shit takes a while. 
Like, there's this one project I've been going back and forth with these people since July. It's December. And it's still not solidified yet. Mm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, and some people, they hit and then they fizzle out. And you have to make sure, like, Tone won in 2011. Yeah. He has a show now that he's starring on. It's 2015. That was that's four years. Mm -hmm. But Tone has made sure that he stays on top of it, stays relevant, because there was two other shows before this show that he did with NBC. So you can't be afraid of silence. <laughs> and that's what it always is. You can't be afraid of silence. You can't be afraid that your phone's not ringing. This is work. Like people, you know, it's like talking about comics, like pigeon, like, you know, oh, I'm a comic because I'm fucked up. No, stop it. You're a fucking comic because you want to, because you're a performer and you chose comedy. I'm a performer and I do stand up. I'm an actor. I do improv. I do sketch. I'm a performer. You've done singing and modeling as well. Right. Singing and, you know, because most of the plays that I've been in have been musicals. Mm -hmm. So, and then I've done some lifestyle modeling, you know, you know, I'm the kid. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, because people are like, oh, you didn't start stand up because, you know, you were fucked up. You know, stuff you need to work out. I'm like, no. I got to stand up because somebody told me I was a fucking comic and then kept popping up in my life mm -hmm. and then pulled me into a class. And my mother had a fucking dream about it. And so now I have to do this. And Big Kenny told me, he said, you'll get all that stuff that you want to get when you start doing stand up. You'll become a better comic when you start talking about yourself. Mm. Because I had a, like, there was a point where, like, I was, like, in, I was doing it for, like, I think it was, like, a year and a half in. And I was just doing the stuff that, you know, really observational shit. Mm -hmm. And Bikini kept telling me, if you talk about yourself, how you feel about stuff, stuff that has happened to you, you're going, you're going to have a break. And it is all going to start happening. You're talking about, you know, guys talking to you in the grocery store and stuff right now. But you're yeah. moving in the direction of, like, okay, there's social issues going on here. Right. They don't understand. And you're talking about Margaret Cho being that same way of speaking on activism and things. Right. I mean, you've only been doing, you've been doing comedy less than seven years. Right. So and you're so still figuring out. I'm still figuring so out. So much. You know, my voice. You'll comics, get there. Right. And it's like, but like comics who are like, oh, I got it. Like you write, like comics that write every day. I don't get it. I don't. But I understand the whole stream of consciousness. I get it. But I'm like, you got a new joke that pops up every fucking. How? <laughs> Craziness. <laughs> Craziness. <laughs> Because I get them when they come or when something happens or something that occurred. Like, you know, I was doing this thing for a little bit about Suge Knight and how I love him. And I'm so upset these things are happening. I love Suge Knight. Mm -hmm. So upset. <laughs> so upset he's going through these things. It's like, ain't many G's left, man. Well, I love you. Love you too. And I, I appreciate you being on here. I mean, but before, before we adjourn, mm -hmm. is there anything else you want the world to know? Um... I'm nice. I want a husband. I want kids. I want everybody to be okay. I want my mom to be fine. I want everybody I know to be all right. And I want people to get opportunities because they're good. Not because their dad is somebody or they got the, or they've had these opportunities or whatever. I want people to be seen because they're good. I got to make sure that what I do is okay. Like, I'm okay with it. Everything that comes, every product that I produce, everything that I put out, I'm okay with it because it's like, you get to a certain point, you're not responsible for you anymore. Because the problem is when white people are actors, they're actors. When black people are actors, they were responsible for every fucking black person on the planet. <laughs> I come from Atlanta. There is a list of motherfuckers that I'm going to forget. Well, don't forget about me. You didn't do anything for me to fucking forget about you. Awesome. You've always been helpful. You've always been encouraging for me. You've always wanted, you know, if I needed some time, I needed to get on the show to work for something. You've always been helpful to me. You've always been supportive of me. But those people that you forget are the people who weren't supportive. Because if they weren't supportive when you first started, how do poor, how how can you trust how supportive they will be when you quote unquote make it? Well, let supporters know where they can find you and keep up with you as far as social media, website, everything. Every, uh, everything is, uh, it's dulcesloan.com. I have a fan page on Facebook. 
Um, Instagram, Dulce Sloan. Twitter, Dulce Sloan. All of the things, Dulce Sloan. D-U-L-C-E-S-L-O-A-N. Um, yeah, so I hope I didn't get too off track or sound too upset. No, no. This is this is a big pivot in your career, and that's why I wanted you on here right now. It's because you've put in a lot of hard work, and it is starting to pay off, and you're only going to climb from here. I mean, you know, this is the first time I saw you perform. I knew, you know, there was something special going on, so I look forward to seeing you continue to get what you've earned. Thank you. So, uh, gracias, so- Dulce Sloan. <laughs> And I just want people to know I'm not Hispanic. Like people are like, <laughs> like the girls like, oh, you're Latin. So like, what's your? Because there were like three Latin people on the yeah. showcase. And they're like, so where's your family from? I'm like Miami. Like, so what do you like? I'm like I'm black. <laughs> like, so what about like no, nah, I'm nah, 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 black. Mm-hmm. No one speaks Spanish but me. <laughs> like, so how did you get your name? My mom had a friend. Oh, your mom had a friend. Who My mother you? had a friend in high school named Dulce, a Cuban girl. Okay, and she liked the name, so she's like, "I gave it to you because I liked it." Um, but I was gonna change my last name to her last name when I turned like twenty-one, and her last name is Hill. And I was talking to somebody about it, and they're like, "What's your last name?" And they're like, "I was like Sloan." And they're like, it "Just flows better." Like Dulce Sloan, Dulce Hill. Dulce Sloan, Dulce Hill. All right, I guess it works. And well, it flows better. So now we know. Now we know. I almost changed my name. And the name I have now is not my name. What is it? When I was born, my middle my first name and my middle name were switched. And then my mother, like two hours later, like switched it back. But this is like when they like did birth certificates with a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> So my little mama called downstairs. She's like, nope, I'm flipping it. And they were like, okay. And then they trudge upstairs with the typewriter. And they're like, okay, what is it now? Because she changed it like three times. And they're like, listen, this is her name. Like, fuck, what is it? And they typed it up again. She was like, all right, fine. So now I'm Dulce Sloan. So the name in the sidewalk will be Dulce Sloan. Yes. And if I get my accent mark, that would be hilarious. It would be amazing. It would be amazing. If I could just get my accent mark on shit. I believe you will. It's well earned and deserved. Thank you Thank so you. much for your time, Dulce Sloan. Thank you, Jolie. Yeah. High five. Why did you call this high breath anyway? Just, it was a catchy name. So. Caffeinate your ears. People won't forget it. High breath. Hot breath.